Welcome to the Smithsonian's National Museum of, Amer of American History and our live webcast, The Roosevelt's, a conversation with Ken Burns. We'll have a chance to talk with Ken about his new film, The Roosevelt's, our panel of experts, and see some objects from the Smithsonian's National Collection. And we'll start right after this. Okay, so when we come back from this, we want um, applause. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Welcome back, and uh, first I'd like to thank our partners at WETA Television, as well as uh, Ken and Florentine Films for making this webcast happen. We also have a special welcome from the new chairman of the National Endowment for Humanities, William Bro Adams. The National Endowment for the Humanities is proud to support The Roosevelts, an intimate history. Like all Ken Burns films, it is a remarkably ambitious project presenting the life and work of one of America's greatest political families in spanning nearly 100 years. Many of the names and events covered here, the Roosevelts, the Depression, the New Deal, may be familiar, but the film goes beyond what we think we know by exploring the battles these important figures waged both politically and personally, and considering the lasting impact of the Roosevelt family on our politics and our culture. We learn as much about the sweeping changes of the 20th century as we do about these three extraordinary individuals seen in all their human complexity. Teddy Roosevelt said in his 1903 Labor Day speech, far and away the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. At the NEH we believe our nation is strengthened when students and scholars and indeed all citizens explore history thinking critically and considering together how the past has influenced our lives and continues to shape our future. It is indeed work worth doing. I hope you enjoy the film. Thanks, Dr. Adams, and yes, I hope and trust that uh, folks are enjoying the film already. It debuted on Sunday night on PBS, but if, even if you missed the first couple of episodes, you can catch it the rest of this week on your local PBS station. Now I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, we have a wonderful panel here with us today. And first, uh, Ken Burns, the director of The Roosevelt's. And Ken, let me congratulate you on such a wonderful film. Thank you so much. And, and if you have missed it, if you go to pbs.org, you can catch up with all the things that you haven't uh, been able to see. And the DVDs are also available today, uh, starting today. So uh, you don't have to lag behind. That's wonderful. Um, also with <coughs> us is historian Clay Jenkinson, a uh, frequent collaborator with Ken on a number of his projects, also a historian not only of, of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, but uh, Thomas Jefferson. So thank you for being with us here today, Clay. Uh, Clay. I'm delighted to be here. I come from North Dakota, where Roosevelt spent about four years becoming the great man that we all adore. And another longtime collaborator with Ken, biographer and writer Jeffrey Ward. Welcome, Jeffrey. Glad to be here. I've spent 30 years thinking about Franklin Roosevelt, and it's a dream of my life to have this mm -hmm. show on. So. And also, uh, my colleague, Harry Rubenstein, who is chair and curator of the Political History Collection here at the National Museum of American History. And Harry, you've got some objects from the collection that you're going to share with us a little bit later, right? Sure. Just a small taste, but nonetheless, I think some interesting objects. I'd like, also like to welcome our audience here at the Smithsonian, uh, teacher Jason Fox and students from C.D. Hilton High School in uh, Prince William County, Virginia. And last I checked, we were joined by uh, students across the country in about 30 states, as well as Canada, and hola los estudiantes en España, because we are an international today, both uh, Canada and Spain. So welcome to our online audience as well. Uh, quick notes about our webcast. For those of you watching online, you'll see over to the right of the screen 
our uh, chat window, which today we're calling uh, our fireside chat window. Uh, you'll see <laughs> one of the objects that in the Smithsonian mm -hmm. collection, one of our fireside chat microphones, it's over there. And so in that window, you'll be able to converse with others who are watching the webcast, also ask questions of our panel, and uh, we really want this to be a conversation both in the room here today and uh, on the internet and ongoing as you continue to watch this film. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to get into uh, the first Roosevelt that we're gonna talk about here today, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, we have a clip from the film, and why don't, um, uh, Ken, if you can just tell us a little bit about uh, what we're gonna see and, and the Roosevelt that you, the Teddy Roosevelt that you portrayed in this film. Well, we were interested in, in joining the story of the three Roosevelts into a complicated family drama that people haven't done. They've tended to be segregated, I think, in, in, in larger, probably small part because Theodore's a Republican and Franklin's a Democrat. There, there are many more things that connect them. But in any case, Theodore Roosevelt uh, was just an extraordinary force of nature. He was called a, a steam locomotive uh, with trousers. And um, in this little clip, you get a sense of what an extraordinary, uh, complicated, excitable little child the President of the United States is. Let's see that clip now. I wonder how a man so thick-set, of rather abdominal contour, with eyes heavily spectacled, could have so much an air of magic and wild romance about him could give one so stirring an impression of adventure and chivalry. The Metropolitan Magazine. Fueled by cup after cup of coffee, served to him in a special mug his eldest son said was as big as a bathtub, Theodore Roosevelt raced through his day. Letters were answered upon receipt, a lifetime total of 150,000, dictated to shifts of weary stenographers. Jefferson wrote 22,000 letters, and we regard him as one of the great correspondents in American history. Roosevelt wrote at least 150,000 letters. And he's the writingest president in American history, by far. And a number of his books are American classics. So he's an intellectual. He read a book a day, sometimes three books in a day when he had some leisure. You think of Jefferson as America's Renaissance man, but it's really Roosevelt. He would not stop talking. He was a one-man gas bag. But it was so interesting that most people didn't mind. One of my favorite stories is when he heard that there was a famous big game hunter in Washington, and he said to some of the people on the staff, get that man over here, I'd really like to meet him. So this big, strapping English fellow was taken into the president's office, and the door was closed, and people outside the office heard this talking going on. Finally, the man emerged about an hour and a half later, looking just beat down to, as though he'd been through a storm. And one of the president's staff said, what did you tell the president? He said, I told him my name. We love him because of the energy. His laugh was infectious. His son, Ted, said, my father had a dozen eggs for breakfast every morning. So he's a large man, and he's larger than life. Roosevelt once said, there's nothing quite so exhilarating as being thrown over the shoulders of a 300-pound Japanese man. He played all these wild games in the White House. He wrestled with diplomats. He played a game called Single Stick with Leonard Wood, in which they would wrap themselves up in cushions and then beat the living daylights out of each other with sticks until Roosevelt had to stop. He boxed with a young aide, too, until a blow caused him to lose vision in his left eye. Accordingly, I thought it better to acknowledge that I had become an elderly man and would have to stop boxing, he remembered. I then took up jujitsu for a year or two. Photographers were forbidden to cover his daily tennis games because he thought voters considered tennis a rich man's pastime. But when a cameraman failed to capture his horse jumping over an obstacle, he was more than happy to make the jump again. 
Roosevelt bit me, the editor William Allen White said, and I went mad. Great. So, yes. So let's talk a little bit more about this uh, Theodore Roosevelt personality, but also this idea of get action in his uh, in his personality. How did that uh, how did that evidence itself in his political life and in in the Roosevelt White House? Well, I think the first thing is to understand that all of this has its source in his personal life and his upbringing, and that was one of the things that Jeff and I wanted to do, and with Clay's extraordinary help, I think this was an inside-out portrait, and, and Theodore Roosevelt was a very sickly, asthmatic child, not expected to live out of uh, his childhood. In fact, he overheard a doctor telling that to his parents. It must have been devastating. His father uh, urged him to get action, to be sane, and, and there was a kind of streak of melancholy that ran in the Roosevelt family, and he had to sort of keep going in order to make sure those demons didn't catch up with him. He has this wonderful phrase after he lost. He had suffered great tragedy in his life. He lost his mother and his wife on the same day in the same house, February 14th, 1884, and he went out to the Dakotas and really began to try to heal himself from this overwhelming grief. The light has gone out of my life. But he said, black care can rarely sit behind a rider whose pace is fast enough, mm -hmm. which means in, it's a 19th century way of saying what we'd understand today, which is you can outrun your demons. Mm. And that's what Theodore Roosevelt did all his life. And those demons were real. And he's, in many cases, unstable, but the part of him that that uh, the country fell in love with was this energy, this authenticity. He was resolutely himself, the historian David McCullough says, and that's really true. And he had a privileged upbringing, but he really felt it was important uh, that you level the playing field, that for too long, for too many decades, the rich had had a disproportionate number amount of influence on how government affairs went, and really the middle class and the lower classes were left completely out of the mm -hmm. conversation. He, a rich man, wanted to add them to the conversation, and he did. And the Roosevelt we meet in the film is just ex ex exceedingly driven toward that. And Clay and Jeff, maybe comment a little bit on, on his drives. Well, his father challenged him when he was 12, and he said, your mind is strong, but your body is weak. You'll never achieve your potential if you let your body hold you back. You must make your body. And if ever a human being just willed himself to overcome a very significant set of problems, it was Theodore Roosevelt. And then he wanted to change the world. That's what makes him so extraordinary. He didn't just want power, but he, of course he wanted power, but he wanted to change the world. And really three things helped him. He was a genuine war hero. That took him a long way. He was our first cowboy president, and the mythology of that just covers all the ground after his time out in North Dakota. And he had this almost unbelievably large energy you know, he lived 90 or 100 years worth of life in his 60 years. And he's exhausting. He's, he must have exhausted everyone that he ever met. Mm -hmm. But he used all of those capacities to change the world for the better. The Roosevelt's all, FDR, Eleanor, TR, had this urge to make life better for average Americans. And that's really the heart of their legacy. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's right. And I think uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt, really none of us would ever have heard of them if Theodore Roosevelt had not, his extraordinary example had not existed. He is an absolutely amazing human being. You can study, he has a thousand facets, as Clay knows better than anyone, and uh, he's, he's just infinitely rewarding. And he expressed, and I think when we see him jumping around on the screen and doing all these fast mo motion things, you forget too how substantive he was. He was an extraordinary president. He changed really the nature of the presidency, and he expressed a kind of um, optimism about America and the future that we don't have so much today, but he had it in spades. He thought we were going to do many of the things that we've actually done. He, he was an amazingly energetic and mm -hmm. extraordinary human being. He effectively brought the United States into the 20th century, yeah. sort of kicking Literally. and screaming <laughs> at times, and yeah. he said, we're now a major player on the world stage. And I'm going to teach the American people to step up and accept that global responsibility. And because of that, for example, he was the first American to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And right. the first mm -hmm. president to leave the country. During his time yeah, in during office. During his time That's in right. office, which is an amazing thing to consider that it took that long. Uh, 
more than half the presidents we've had to get to somebody who'd actually have the confidence to leave the country and inspect the Panama Canal. His mm -hmm. canal. He also invited the first African American ever to dine with him in the White House, which was an extraordinarily bold and courageous move for which he took a tremendous amount of criticism. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and because of this bigger than life uh, personality and, and uh, you know, all the images that you see of him, him doing these things, talk a little bit about what you think, uh, how that affects his legacy. I think uh, some of the time we may think about some of those, uh, those aspects of, of, uh, of Roosevelt's presidency and not think about some of the, uh, the substantial uh, political uh, well, qual th qualifications. Th that's a really good question. You know, he, he was disappointed. Uh, he felt that you couldn't be judged great unless you'd had a great crisis occur on your watch mm -hmm. as president, as Abraham Lincoln, the, obviously the great hero that, that had set in motion the Republican Party. Um, but I think Theodore Roosevelt proved that you could have a great presidency without that mm -hmm. thing, and that I think that when we look at the national parks and the national forests and the game preserves, we look at the Panama Canal, we look at the settling of the Russo-Japanese War for which he won uh, the Nobel Prize, his prescience about what would take place in the future with regard to another Pacific War that he understood would be even more catastrophic and involve the United States for exactly the right reasons that the Japanese would want the Philippines. I mean, he called it and even called the outcome of it, but said, quite correctly that it would be devastating. He's wonderful. We, we made a film on the national parks, and we interviewed uh, Stuart Udall, the former Secretary of the Interior, and he said that Theodore Roosevelt had what they called distance in his eyes, mm -hmm. that he could sort of see beyond the horizon, that he understood mm -hmm. the coming issues. I think all three Roosevelts had distance in their eyes, particularly Eleanor. Uh, freed from having to report directly to constituents, but Theodore Roosevelt had that, and I think you, there's a kind of magic that's going on, and, 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 and I don't want to, to not s talk about some of these aspects of him that are less pleasant, you know, this sort of sense that war is a good thing, pushing his own sons toward combat with horrible, tragic outcomes, and, and his crowded hour at San Juan Hill is also has a degree of recklessness to it, but for the, for the most part, the record of his administration is extraordinary, and it really does redirect the energies of the United States, not just into a global uh, stage, but in a sense of what the new relationship of the government had to be to its citizens. And heretofore, it had been a kind of passive bystander, and now it was actively engaged in seeing if it could fix its problems. And I think a lot of this is born out of the crucible of adversity that all three of them, but particularly Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt in this case, experienced. And I think even internally, in, ter in terms of internal American politics, you make the point in the film, uh, before Roosevelt, president didn't get out and no. campaign for bills like we right. think of Obamacare or something like that, but yeah. that just wasn't uh, what a president did yeah. while he was in office. Speak, speaking of Obamacare, yeah. I, I, we, we get asked a lot what would Franklin Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt or Eleanor <laughs> Roosevelt think today. The one thing I know is that Theodore Roosevelt would be astounded <laughs> that something he proposed in 1912 is still being argue about, argued about public health. It, it, I think he would be flabbergasted that somebody hadn't had the energy and taken the action and gotten this done long before. T.R. believed in power. He was comfortable with power. Yeah. You know, there are really two types of presidents, caretaker presidents and then activist presidents. And between Abraham Lincoln, who was sort of forced to be an activist president, and Roosevelt, there wasn't a single great president. And he decided, I'm going to make the most of this. Yep. There are things that need to be done. I'm not afraid of this. Yep. If there's a vacuum, I'll fill it. And yep. if they don't <laughs> like it, they'll push back. Yep. But if ever there was a man comfortable with using power for the good, it was and Theodore, and of course he set the table for his Franklin fifth cousin Franklin. Franklin. Right. Who then achieved even more mm -hmm. uh, than, than anyone could ever imagine, and obviously is the greatest president of the 20th century, and arguably the greatest president of all time, with Lincoln certainly achieving a kind of parody of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. but, but the table is set, as Jeff says, no Theodore, there's no Franklin, there's right. no Eleanor. It isn't just the last name that uh, Franklin needed to sort of climb up in his uh, interesting and improbable trajectory, but it's also the model the of example, that activist, yeah. committed, passionate for the greater good that all three of them, uh, they drank the Kool-Aid on that. Mm -hmm. And we are all, the world that we live in today is, uh, is better for it in yeah. almost every respect. They were privileged. 
Yeah. And they knew that not everybody was. Mm -hmm. And there was a key moment in Roosevelt Theodore's life when Jacob Reese published his book, How the Other Half Lives, and Roosevelt actually went into the, some of the slums and tenements of New York, and he realized, oh my goodness, this can't be acceptable yeah. in a right. great society. Right. Yeah. And there's another moment that follows that when Eleanor, who's doing more than the noblesse oblige that the debutantes of that day did, sort of visiting the tenement houses, she's actually down there and getting her hands dirty and rolling up her sleeves and getting things done and taking public transportation. She invites Franklin down there and, and a, a little girl falls sick and he has to carry her back to a tenement and he cannot believe that human beings live like this in yeah. these kind of conditions. And this was the squalid conditions of the tenements for the teeming immigrant populations that came into the United States. And I, I think these were all transforming uh, events for all three of them. A yep. the sense of their privilege obligated them to do something else. Great. Well, um, you know, I want to um, now uh, talk a little bit um, more about the Smithsonian connection with uh, with Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, it's really um, apropos to be starting the conversation on on Theodore Roosevelt and uh, having it here at the Smithsonian because he had a lifelong connection to the Smithsonian Institution. He played a critical role in the acquisition of the Freer Gallery of Art. He encouraged research and study in the Panama Canal uh, Zone, uh, which we're now celebrating more than 100 years of Smithsonian involvement in that area. He was a staunch supporter of the um, U.S. National Museum. Uh, he signed the bill authorizing the construction of a new building for the, for the museum, which says today the National Museum of Natural History, which opened its doors to the public 100 years ago. And he collected many animals for the museum while on a post-presidency exhibition or expedition to East Africa. Um, and those specimens formed the, one of the core of one of the museum's most popular exhibits. Uh, you're looking at some images of both uh, Teddy on uh, safari in Africa, as well as some, uh, uh, some specimens that he collected uh, for the Smithsonian uh, starting in 1870 uh, when he was just a child, um, all the way up till uh, while he was in president. He's the only president to have collected a natural history specimen while in office, and then uh, in the his post-presidency expedition. And in fact, just this morning, I was talking with, uh, with our curator of uh, mammals at the Natural History Museum, who wanted to remind us that when you think, when you see these images of Teddy as a big game hunter, you think he's just going across the country shooting things and so forth, but rushing across the world, you know, uh, shooting animals. But he really, we, can you mention, mention his prescience? He realized that someday that the, uh, the natural history, the, the animals and plants of Africa wouldn't survive into the 20th century um, as, they, as he is, was experiencing them. And so that collection, we still use that to understand the natural world today. It wasn't just that he was coming home with trophies. Um, that's a great segue to the collection here at the National Museum of American History and our politics and reform collection. I'm going to turn it over to Harry Rubenstein to tell us what he's brought down today. Well, I ran around storage and just pulled a small sampling of our Roosevelt material. I think it's material that gives a sense of the personality of some of these incredible individuals, but also reflects how Americans felt about them. And I'm with Carmen. You're a student at? C.D. Hilton High School. Um, so thanks so much for joining. Um, I asked you earlier whether you had a brother, and you said? I have an older brother. Um, and my question was, did he have any action figures growing yes. up? Did you have any action figures? Well, this happens to be an action figure of Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> um, and possibly one of the earliest action figures in American history. And I mean, it just reflects the sort of personality That's of both great. the individual, but also about how Americans felt about it. And that infectious nature in his personality, they just wanted to embrace. And so they produced things like this and ha had them at home. Um, I think. Many of us also have one of the signature items associated with Teddy Roosevelt. Um, you're standing in front of it. Yes, the teddy bear. This, this happens not to be any old teddy bear. It's one of the first teddy bears ever made. Um, the story behind the bear is that there was a young couple in Brooklyn, New York. Teddy Roosevelt goes on a hunting trip. There's a, a bear that's chased down for him to kill. 
He refuses to kill it because it's tied to a tree. There's a famous cartoon that's made about the bear. This couple in Brooklyn write to Teddy Roosevelt and they say, can we name our stuffed bear after that hunting trip and, and after you? He says, yes, and the teddy bear is born. Um, over here we have the other President Roosevelt. Um, and, and his relationship with the public is very different than his cousin. Um, it, it's, you know, he enters into the home at a moment of crisis. And one of the great moments in Roosevelt's presidency is right at the very beginning when he begins to give these very intimate fireside chats. And you've all seen these pictures. You've seen the picture of the desk covered up with, with various um, microphones. Well, this happens to be one of those microphones that was on that desk. And it's a way of, of reaching in. Um, and one of the things that's amazing when you stop and think about it is that the relationship that he had with people in the home, they wanted to embrace ever more. And so they began to start buying up pictures of Roosevelt and hanging them up over their mantles. Here we have this great mantle clock. I've always liked, liked this thing. And you have Roosevelt steering the ship of state through obviously the storms of both the Depression and later the storms of war. The, this, you know, wasn't done before um, Franklin Roosevelt, where so many people brought, tried to bring him. He came into the home, and they tried to keep him in the home with things like this. Um, I was looking for something from Eleanor Roosevelt that had that same kind of iconic personality, and she seems to be beyond that in some ways, or not related to that. There isn't that signature sort of feeling about her, but there, we're, we have some wonderful personal aspects. Um, whenever you see any images, and you'll see, you'll see them in all the films of Eleanor Roosevelt, you'll see her in a hat. There's, there's one of her hats. This actually was a hat made for her first inauguration. Um, I've noticed in the films that she seems to be wearing a different hat, so it's not the, the hat that goes with her suit. A um, <laughs> pair of her eyeglasses. And then I have some invitations from the White House. And one of the things, an important role that Eleanor plays is she's introducing different people into the White House. And so there's an invitation for choral singers from Howard University, or the Hampton Institute, or a Native American group. And she serves this bridge with a wider community. So you'll have to come back and come up in the storage and see some mm -hmm. more things, but this is just a small taste. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering about the clock. It seems that he's leaning on it, and was that, did he actually pose for that, or was that just the image that the artist had? purely an imaginary image that the artist had. I mean, you will see um, that you know, Roosevelt is always portrayed often without um, showing his braces or that he had polio. Um, and though this is just another one of those visualizations of, of Roosevelt. And also, for the teddy bear, how did Theodore feel about being uh, associated with such a loving child's toy? Oh, I mean, according to the story, is that he writes back and says he'd be honored. He doesn't know whether this will help the sales or not, but he'd be honored to share his name. <laughs> um, the sad the thing is that letter has been lost, and so we don't know if it's just a good family story or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for coming. Well, thanks so much, Harry. Um, and uh, I think it's wonderful to have those objects here, of course, uh, with uh, what, what Ken has done with the film and Clay and, and Jeff working on this film. Uh, there are so many different ways of understanding history through film, what we do here at museums, through documents, uh, through images, and uh, putting that all together, you start getting a wonderful sense of the past uh, from many different sources. Now we have one of our uh, uh, students in our audience who would like to ask a question. Let me ask you, uh, say who you are and what, what, uh, who your question is for. Uh, I'm Ian Meyer. I've been seeing you before. So um, my question it actually kind of jumps over to Eleanor. Um, as Franklin Roosevelt's legs, so to speak, um, how much control over where she went and what she did was really given to her as opposed to the president and his aides? She, she went wherever she wanted to go. <laughs> <laughs> she was an extraordinary 
individual herself. And she had all of her uncle's energy. And she really, I, I think every young woman in the United States ought to know about Eleanor Roosevelt because she, she shows you what character and, and moral fervor and intelligence can do and how unimportant all the other things are that you hear about. Um, she's an amazing person. And she, she really did, made all those decisions on her own. Occasionally, he would say, don't go there this week because there's some political reason. But on the whole, she did what she felt she needed to do. And her, her entire life was devoted to serving other people. It's how she felt she could be admired and loved. And um, she did an unbelievable number of things for an unbelievable number of people. Uh, uh, without benefiting from it. She's an absolutely extraordinary person. Thanks so much. We're gonna, and we'll get even more into Eleanor Roosevelt in just a bit, but I'd like to transition now um, to talk about Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and uh, we're going to see a clip, uh, a little bit about, uh, about uh, him and his presidency and some of the challenges that he had to face, but um, maybe from the panel just to hear a little bit about uh, Franklin to start that conversation off. Well, I, you know, the clip is going to start at, at one of the most critical moments in the history of the United States, March 4th, 1933, which was the day that he was uh, uh, inaugurated as president. And the country was in, you know, the third year of depression and, and really in dire, dire straits. And uh, you can say without a doubt the right man uh, met the, r the, the right moment and met those challenges uh, so remarkably that when you think about how we are today, so much of it uh, has to do with what Franklin Roosevelt was able to do, building on, on Theodore's legacy. Uh, he did it not from outrunning his demons. He couldn't even walk. He couldn't take a single step after 1921 when he was stricken at age 39 with infantile paralysis, polio. Uh, and it really is a testament to the human spirit that he got as far as he was able to do. He always was certain he was going to have a cure or figure out how to get better. He never, ever got better. But he, he made the rest of us better. And that's... Uh, an amazing uh, accomplishment. I mean, the, the sad thing is to worry about whether today he could get elected, mm -hmm. uh, given his infirmity, the fact that he'd be in a, a wheelchair and we'd be vying to sort of get the worst coverage of the arduous you know, pain it, it, it exacted just to unlock the braces and, and get up uh, with the help of others and crutches and the great strain and the sweat pouring off his brow or to sit down or to move uh, even a few feet. Um, it's, it's like, like Theodore, like Eleanor, this incredible testament to sort of human will. Uh, and these people are all taking the lemons that have been handed to them and making a kind of very sweet lemonade. I'm not a, a FDR scholar, and certainly I defer to Jeffrey Ward, but what I think is, is the genius of this film and the genius of Ken Burns is the way that he examines that. There's nothing sensational about it or prurient but he has found footage that has rarely been mm -hmm. seen before of Franklin. And as the film goes on in the course of the seven episodes, you see Franklin being worn down by the burdens of the presidency and the world crisis that he had to get us through. And there are scenes that are almost impossible to watch exactly. in the film where he's straining to get onto his legs, or in one situation he falls, or that last uh, speech before a joint session of Congress where he says, I just have to sit, I can no longer. Yes. Stan, and it it's is an the amazing first acknowledgement. He's been president since 1933, and this is near the end of the Second World War, and it's the first acknowledgement to the public that there's a, a reason that he might be sitting down. Uh, he's made this long trip, but it's also, he says, I've got 10 pounds of steel Makes on my legs. Makes a little joke out of it. But and and, and I, I think, you know, that's an amazing moment. There's a great moment in the American Revolution when there's uh, talk of mutiny and, and a revolt, mm. and... and uh, Washington begins to read something and has to take out spectacles and there's this shock that he he needs glasses and he says you know I you see I have grown old and nearly gray and and nearsighted and nearly blind in the service of my country and the revolution just you know stops that's what you know intimate history means about yes. this film it is it's epic in its dimensions but you know Ken has that capacity to get inside and show you what it was like to be a disabled president who had to rise to this occasion I do, yeah, I'd, you, you've said it all, but I, I just think whenever you see him as president, you have to remember 
he, although he's in command of every scene in which he appears, he can't get a glass of water or move across the room on his own. And it, it's an astonishing performance. It's, performance. it's the word for yeah. it. He's a great, great actor in addition to being a very great president. Right, so he had these, this uh, just remarkable um, personal um, challenge that he had to triumph over, but the, what was challenging him within the nation and internationally is something else that is, you know, was, uh, was remarkable. And let's look at that in this clip. There have been three presidents who were larger than the office they inherited. One was Washington, who fairly invented the office. There was Lincoln, who preserved the country at the center of which sits that office. And then there was Roosevelt, who fundamentally changed the relationship of the citizen to the central government. The presidency is like a soft leather glove, and it takes the shape of the hand that's put into it. And when a very big hand is put into it and stretches the glove, stretches the office, the glove never quite shrinks back to what it was. So we are all living today with an office enlarged permanently by Franklin Roosevelt. A president could be judged great, Theodore Roosevelt once explained, only if he had faced and overcome a great crisis. Franklin Roosevelt would find himself confronted by the two greatest crises since the Civil War. He had been taught since boyhood to believe himself capable of succeeding at anything to which he put his mind and hand. And in part, because of that belief, he proved to have the power to make a majority of his fellow citizens believe it too. The best of the New Deal programs was Franklin Roosevelt's smile. He was armored with Christian faith that the universe is well organized and with the American faith that history is a rising road and things are going to be all right. He had that enormous head and that wonderful grin and it was the tonic the country needed. The country was depressed. We use the word depression in lots of ways. And what they needed was a man who was incapable of depression. I have never known a man who gave one a greater sense of security. I never heard him say that there was a problem that he thought it was impossible for human beings to solve. I never knew him to face life or any problem that came up with fear. Franklin Roosevelt was essentially a lonely man. No one was allowed to know all that was going on within what one eight called his thickly forested interior. That becomes a habit in your life to not reveal yourself to others as if there's a scar that you're afraid that someone else will see. You always have to be the one that's up. You always have to be the one that's doing well. And it means that you're not in touch in a certain sense with some of those emotions within yourself. It makes it harder for you, but it also makes you more mysterious, more magical perhaps to the outside world. Ideology did not interest him. Once asked for his philosophy, he said he was a Christian and a Democrat, and that was all. He was steeped in tradition and conservative by instinct, but he was also utterly unafraid of experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and try it, he said. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. I want to be a preaching president, FDR said, like my cousin, Theodore. And he believed, just as Theodore Roosevelt had believed, that the presidency was preeminently a place of moral leadership. Great. Well, um, we do have a question that's come in from uh, our fireside chat, and this is from Megan. And it's a question about uh, how socially progressive was FDR, really? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I can't think of anyone uh, 
who comes close, uh, Theodore. Um, certainly Abraham Lincoln in terms of uh, the transformation of the role of African Americans within a society that tolerated chattel slavery, Lyndon Bain Johnson. But I think that uh, Franklin Roosevelt more than anyone else in the social programs of the New Deal, many of them are with us, not just in ideas like Social Security and the GI Bill, uh, in the enlargement of our uh, natural environment, uh, but also in our physical infrastructure. As you look around this extraordinary mall in Washington, as you uh, think about all the high schools and bridges and miles and miles of roads around the country, the elevated in Chicago, the power in the Northwest and Southwest and the Tennessee Valley, all of these things are the legacies of him. And all of them were attempt to get the United States back on its feet after the Depression. And then, like Theodore Roosevelt had had to do a generation earlier, help bring his very reluctant country into the world stage to meet the greatest challenge in all of human history, which is the Second World War. And the fact that he would be the captain that ship of uh, uh, steering that ship of state uh, for so long, the longer than any other president by far, uh, and doing it so magnificently. Uh, Progressivism is is really even too poor a word. I mean, he was essentially conservative, but he was also trying, as as the narration says, to to do whatever worked mm -hmm. and figure out a solution. I just wanted to say, it, when we look back, we see him as hugely successful and progressive, and he was all those things. Each one of those things involved a hard won fight with enormous opposition. I don't think any president, perhaps except the current one has ever had the kind of vilification that FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt had, and they held firm to their beliefs, and they got a lot done. Um, it, it, it's really hard to convey the hatred that a certain number of people really had for them. When his uh, memoirs were published, <laughs> uh, they didn't sell very well, because it was in the middle of a moment, the court packing fight, when he was not very popular. And a book seller tried to explain it to the publisher, and he said, we will accept as many sets of his speeches as you can send us, provided they are bound in Franklin Roosevelt's skin. Mm -hmm. And it gives you some sense of, mm -hmm. of uh, how much they were hated. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are these two fundamental crises, the Depression and World War II, and the orthodoxy in the United States was to do nothing about either of them, mm -hmm. to last, outlive the, the Depression, that was Herbert Hoover's plan, and maybe not get involved in the crisis in Europe. And that's Franklin right. Roosevelt said, no, that's not going to solve these problems. It took unbelievable political strength to and convince skill. the country to yeah. step up to those moments. OK, well, we'll have a chance to ta uh, talk more about Franklin Roosevelt um, when we open it up for, for some more questions. But uh, I want to get to our final clip, which is getting toward uh, talking about Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, so let's roll that and then talk about her. The Roosevelt marriage was a partnership in which each played a very important part. Each admired the other. Each wanted very much the approval of the other. That was true throughout their lives together, even when they were mad at each other. They lived very separate lives. Even when they were in the White House, they were very separate lives. And she took a sort of cold view of his fame and, and the kind of popularity he had. She knew who he was, and he wasn't quite who they thought he was. And he sought her approval, but he had all sorts of practical political decisions that he felt he had to make, some of which he disapproved of. And it bothered him when she didn't like it. Jeff, but um, we heard George Will say in the film that the presidency is like a soft leather glove. Uh, what about the first lady's office, and yeah. how did how did Eleanor <laughs> Roosevelt shape that? We'd never seen a first lady like her before. No, I mean every president since Franklin Roosevelt has been measured against uh, him, and usually found wanting. Um, and it's the same thing with the first lady. She simply reinvented the job. Um, her predecessor, Mrs. Hoover, was a nice lady. Uh, was limited to saying things like she approved of the Girl Scouts. Mrs. Roosevelt arrived on the job, began holding press conferences. No first lady had ever done that. 
And then she became an advocate for all of the voiceless people in the country. And she, in fact, drove her husband crazy some of the time because she wouldn't leave him alone. There were people to be helped. And uh, she continued that throughout her life until she died. She's an absolutely extraordinary woman. And TR's wife, Edith, was a reserved, retired woman who did not like the yep. public eye. And she thought that was the template for the First Lady. And when Eleanor burst onto the national scene, it changed the First Lady's role forever. Yeah, and, and if you think about it, the, the issues that we talk about today, the real issues, not the scandals and the criticisms and the opprobrium that's he hurled back and forth between parties and factions and people, uh, they're all the issues that she brought up well before they were common parlance about race, about uh, immigration, about poverty, about children, about health, about women, um, about workers. All of this stuff was new, and she put it on the front burner of the Republic and the front burner of her husband's administration. Now, he had to be a much more pragmatic politician and decide what he could get done, but I, I, I think it's really fair that she is the conscience of that administration and, and goaded her husband on to some pretty spectacular things that we enjoy today, but her example, given her horrible childhood and up upbringing and the orphan, she was orphaned at an early age, um, she just met each challenge and she moved right towards the most difficult part of things. And, it, and Jeff was talking earlier when we were speaking about Eleanor, what an extraordinary example she ought to be to all the young women in the country. I, I, I think everybody, she is really terrific that she goes and, and goes up and confronts the thing that worries her, the thing that fears her the most, and, and does something about it and changes things. She had a, a slogan, do the thing you think you cannot do. And her whole life was like that. And it's a remarkable way to live your life. It is <laughs> indeed. Right. Uh, I think we have another question from our, uh, from our in-house audience. Uh, my question is, like you previously mentioned, we know that the Roosevelt's come from privileged families. How do they manage to become such outspoken proponents for the working class in America? That's a really, really great question. I, I think it begins with Theodore's father, who was something new in America, a, a philanthropist who donated not only his wealth, which is the way um, rich people today sort of try to achieve things, is by buying that achievement. Achievement. He actually dedicated his time to any number of charities and worthwhile institutions like the Museum of Natural History in New York and the Metropolitan Museum, but also charities for school uh, newsboys and orphans and, and, and things like that. He had what he called a troublesome conscience, and his son inherited that, and because Franklin and Eleanor were so close, particularly Eleanor was close to, to Theodore, and because Franklin wanted to hit all the marks that, that Theodore did, I think that they involved it. They had a simple thing. We all do well when we all do well. You know, I mean, that seems sort of obvious, but they got it, and they spent their lives doing that. They understood that their wealth meant nothing if you couldn't extend the benefits or the opportunities that had helped them create that wealth or their ancestors create that wealth. If everybody didn't have that same access, then the country was really a failure. And I think what they did is they held us to a much higher expectation than we had held ourselves before. And we actually grew in, you know, when Thomas Jefferson said, uh, you know, in pursuit of happiness, he suggested that we're a nation in the process of becoming. That is to say, it's all about pursuit, it's not about happiness. And I think what you have happened with the two Roosevelt administrations, aided admirably by Eleanor Roosevelt, is you just had the acceleration of the pursuit. And happiness wasn't, you know, satisfaction in a material world of things, but actually lifelong improvement of the quality of life for all human beings. And that's a really good thing for the United States to be about. T.R. said of his father that he was the greatest man he ever knew and the only man he ever feared. And Theodore Roosevelt Sr. was not a checkbook philanthropist, he was an activist philanthropist. You try to see the list of things that he gave mm. time to, and it fills more than a page in any biography. And he set the tone for the whole Roosevelt clan. They may be Democrats and Republicans, but they, they actually share more than they disagree about. Mm. Right. I agree. 
Um, and we have another question here that's come in uh, from our fireside chat. Uh, and uh, all four of you are historians who work in different medium, whether it's, uh, whether it's film, whether it's writing, whether it's exhibition. Uh, and so this question is one we get a lot uh, in situations like this. Uh, gets to kind of the behind the scenes, how you do what you do um, question. And it comes from uh, Mr. Thomas, a teacher at Packer Collegiate Institute in Brooklyn, New York. And he said, I'd like to teach my middle school students the process, uh, that the process of research is as fascinating as the finished finish process, or pr finished product, I'm sorry. Uh, could Ken Burns and really all of you possibly share an anecdote about the research process for this project uh, that might illuminate that point? Well, I, th I think for all of us, uh, this notion that research is itself a sort of finite period within the larger time frame of a production, in, in my case of a film, uh, is just bunk. I mean, we never stop researching. And the idea that you would close off learning after a relatively short period of time to direct your attention to writing something, that that would be something written in stone that would inform uh, shooting and editing is preposterous if you think about it. But that's too often the way it's done. So we, we sort of feel, and it's a very simple thing, and I'll get out of the way, is that you never stop researching. And we want the last day of editing before we say that's it, to be adding something new. I'm the director of the Theodore Roosevelt Center out in western North Dakota. And we're digitizing all of Roosevelt's papers, every letter, every cartoon, every scrapbook, every diary. And we discover new things literally every week. Just a, a short time ago, we discovered the first letter that Roosevelt wrote from the Badlands in North Dakota the day after he arrived, a letter to his wife, Alice. And it's a world-class letter mm. that has just been sitting in the vaults mm. at Harvard. And now it's going to change the way history is written. That's fantastic. I. Um, I've been doing historical research for 40 years, I guess. I, and I, I just want to say, if you're interested in the past, but more than that, if you're interested in human beings and how human beings work, no matter what period they live in, historical research can't be beat. Yeah. You, mm -hmm. you find, you, if you do it right, you are sitting there and you're suddenly in the middle of someone else's life and it is thrilling to be there and to suddenly realize you've solved some strange historical question that maybe only interests you at that moment, but there's the letter and you suddenly realize a whole new set of things. I, I reckon anybody who wants to do it should be encouraged to do it, it's wonderful. Right, and, and I mean, it's, it's about being curious and having an open and ex mind. Mm -hmm. And that's what leads you from one step to the other. And, as has already been said, it, it's not a finite kind of thing. It's just an ongoing thing where you open yourself up to questions and one question leads to another question. Yeah. Okay, we have another couple of questions. Um, uh, another one from, uh, from Virginia. Uh, which president since uh, TR has, the most, uh, has most embodied his ideals? Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt. <laughs> followed <laughs> followed, followed was by, by Lyndon yeah. Johnson. Okay. Yeah, that's right. All right, well, that's easy. We'll just move on to the next one. <laughs> um, how many years uh, would TR have been president if he, had, um, if he had, hadn't been passed, uh, passing offense on to the next one, if he, if he hadn't stepped down? He served seven years and 171 days. That's filling in for McKinley after his assassination and then his own term. So he would have had eight years and 171 days, or actually 11, 11 if, he, years, if, he, had, yeah. if yeah. he had gotten a third term. Which would be almost not. as yeah. many as, as his cousin. He came Theodore. close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like uh, LBJ, had yeah. he run again. Probably. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. 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 Um, Brandy in uh, the District of Columbia asks, uh, for the panel's thoughts on FDR, Eleanor, uh, and uh, the uh, persecution of Jews by the Nazis, and, and uh, whether, um, uh, how, how uh, they felt about uh, about the Holocaust and what what the United States you know could and should do about it. This is a huge topic. There are libraries of books about it. Um, my my view is uh, that Franklin Roosevelt did more than any other statesman in the world about that problem. Um, he was hampered by a Congress which, which 
could not be persuaded to add numbers of immigrants to the United States. And you have to remember that a lot of the things for which he was blamed happened before the war and before the, what we now call the Holocaust. The word Holocaust was not even applied to this subject until the 1960s. So, um, and I think he was, like many other people, someone who simply, this is disappearing. Let me try again. Um, simply could not imagine that the Holocaust was going to take place. He got it sooner than other people did. Uh, but it, it, it is a very complicated thing. His basic view was Hitler was a madman, that he was the jailer of Europe, that there was no way to get people out of there until you got rid of the madman, which we did. Okay. Another question Ryan asks, um, uh, does the panel feel that the, um, without the, how, how did the constant presence of, of Eleanor's representation of the masses affect uh, Franklin Roosevelt's um, effectiveness with working with Congress? and with what he got done. Well, he, he's a masterful politician, and he knows what he can get done, and he knows what he can't get done, for the most part. He, he has some big mistakes. And so Eleanor, as we were saying earlier, not uh, obligated to any constituency, can be right on every issue, but not necessarily correct on how and when that issue gets addressed. And so that makes them an extraordinary partnership, and, and she's presenting things, and if she could wave a magic wand, she would have done it and made these things happen. But American politics doesn't work that way, and even though Franklin Roosevelt had both houses of Congress in his party, uh, he nevertheless had very conservative Southern committee chairmen who were stopping a great deal of the social agenda, and he had to be uh, very careful uh, and very manipulative in how he got actual accomplishments down. But she's always there representing, for the most part, what the right point of view is, <laughs> period. Um, moving back to uh, Theodore Roosevelt, um, Brett in New Jersey asks, um, when you were looking at uh, Theodore Roosevelt's handling of Japan and the Philippines, did he set the stage for Japanese expansion in the 1930s, and was it a defining moment of his presidency? Well, that's a complicated issue. He actually forestalled the crisis with Japan. He knew it was coming. He was a very forward-thinking man, and he was probably the intellectually best prepared president in American history. He really was reading a book a day, and he knew what there was to know about the world situation. So he intervened in the Russo-Japanese War because he didn't want either side to win too emphatically, and he certainly didn't want the Japanese to overwhelm the Russians because he felt that would hasten the day when we had to confront them. But he knew that confrontation was coming, and then, of course, it inevitably did in 1941. Uh, Ken, we have a question just for you um, from Ron, and he's asking, uh, have you considered doing a series on public education in the, in the U.S.? And, and uh, maybe you can also just think, talk, tell, talk to us a little bit about what's next for you. Well, we have lots of different projects uh, in the works. We've got one on the history of cancer called The Emperor of All Maladies. We're working on a biography, two-part biography of Jackie Robinson. I was just filming George Will uh, in that same <laughs> fireplace situation this morning about that story where uh, Jeff and I are working on a massive 10-part, 18-and-a-half-hour history of the Vietnam War. Uh, we're shooting now a big series on the history of country music called I Can't Stop Loving You, and we're doing a biography <laughs> uh, on the writer Ernest Hemingway. Um, you know, sometimes when you take a didactic idea, a conceptual idea like education, you, you can stumble. If, though, you're telling good stories in American history, you will inevitably run into education. You will inevitably run into race. You will really inevitably run into government and the nature of such. All of these things come in the wake of good storytelling, and that's what we'd much rather do. And rather than stop and set apart and say, let's just do something as amorphous as education, it's there in every instance. And of course, all of our films enter into that educational uh, uh, mainstream as a result of working in public television. And we're thrilled that today is a school day in America, and our Civil War uh, you know, series is being watched perhaps 2,500 times, not all of it, but parts of it. And so too Lewis and Clark, and so too Thomas Jefferson, and World War II and jazz and many of the other things. And we hope very shortly that the Roosevelts will enter into that bloodstream as well. And, and that will be part of the educational discussion. 
Great. And let me just throw a question to Harry, too, and maybe you talk a little bit about what's next for us at this museum in, in this subject matter and, and, uh, and you and your work. Well, I mean, obviously the museum is doing lots of programs and lots of new exhibitions. Um, personally, I'm working on one of those very amorphous topics, American democracy, um, and really trying to address really key questions about what does that mean to live in a society in which we base our, our government and our social relations on this notion of the sovereignty of the people. So that's the sort of topic that we're working, that won't open for a couple of years. Um, next year we're opening up an exhibit on American enterprise. So it's a look at American business in many different facets as well. Okay, well, uh, it's time for us to break. Uh, this has been a wonderful discussion today. Um, I wanna thank our live uh, in-studio audience here, our panel, uh, as well as everyone who has been watching on the internet. Uh, we uh, are looking forward to the rest of the Roosevelt's this week on PBS. Make sure you catch that as well as on pbs.org and the various other ways that you can, uh, you can uh, take a look at that. Uh, we will be replaying this webcast and restreaming it this afternoon afternoon. You can also, if you missed any of it, you can look for that replay today, but then we'll also have it archived on our website at the National Museum of American History. Thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to the Smithsonian's National Museum of, Amer of American History and our live webcast, The Roosevelt's A Conversation with Ken Burns. We'll have a chance to talk with Ken about his new film, The Roosevelt's, our panel of experts, and see some objects from the Smithsonian's National Collection. And we'll start right after this. Okay, so when we come back to this, we want um, the applause. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief